Hey everyone, welcome to Mapping the Minefield of Open Source Software Risks, where we'll be talking about the dumpster fire that is software supply chain security. To give you a quick background on myself, my name is Kyle Kelly. I am the founder at Cramhacks, which is a weekly software supply chain security newsletter. I'm also a security researcher at SimGrip, working on the supply chain security team. And lastly, I'm an executive consultant at BankSec, where we offer cybersecurity consulting services to financial institutions across the United States. As far as education goes, I do have a master's degree in computer science and a number of cybersecurity related certifications. For jumping into the presentation, quickly go over the agenda, which are broken up into three sections where we have industry, prioritization, and easy ones. Ultimately, I'll be covering what are software dependencies, some generalizations around their usage and risks, how to prioritize these vulnerabilities, and some easy ones that can be applied to make life a heck of a lot easier. So, what is a software dependency? Well, software dependency is a specific module, library, or software package that another piece of software relies on to function correctly. In essence, with the help of dependency management tooling for downloading, version management, etc., dependencies are what enable reuse of code at scale. Of course, there are both internal and open source dependencies, but we'll be focusing on open source specifically. So does your organization use open source code? Almost definitely. If you don't, I honestly don't know how you get anything done. Might be a testament to my own software developer skills, but I know for a fact that without open source code, I would not be getting anything done. In 2022 alone, GitHub recorded over 52 million new open source projects. That is absolutely nuts. But focusing on known software dependencies, we can look at a public package repository such as NPM, which hosts somewhere around 3 million unique packages. Now, NPM does by far host the most number of unique packages, but that makes sense given how modular JavaScript tends to be. That being said, others like PyPy are still hosting about 500,000 unique packages. And after you account for different versions, that's over 5 million releases. It's really no surprise that over 90% of organizations use open source software in some shape or form. Maybe a more interesting data point is that any given application, 70 to 90% is likely to comprise of open source code. That being said, there's one major caveat to that statement, which is that although many sources will reference the 70 to 90% figure, in actuality, the coverage is likely much less. And that's just because when you consider active code or lines of code that are actually executed by the application. So open source dependencies often have many, many lines of code, but you are rarely ever using all of them, if ever. And we've actually concluded that for any given dependency imported into a project, you're likely only using roughly 10% of its functionality. Now that we know your organization is using open source software dependencies, let's talk about vulnerabilities. Now for vulnerabilities, in 2023, there were just over 28,000 total CVEs assigned. And this number is trending upwards for sure, but we don't necessarily want to use CVEs as a single source of truth for supply chain vulnerabilities. Firstly, many CVEs are for commercial applications or standalone projects. Secondly, the CVE process is a bit painful, especially in comparison to the simplicity of GitHub security advisories, at least in the context of open source software. That said, we still have a lot of work to do on the vulnerability discovery and disclosure side. So I'd project that this 28,000 total CVE count in 2023 is going to be washed away significantly in the next couple of years. Taking a look at some of the ecosystems covered by the GitHub Security Advisory Database, we can see that ecosystems don't all get the same amount of attention. And this also kind of leads to the determining how much value could you be getting from a software supply chain security tool or software composition analysis tool. If you're using Swift, Elixir, Dart, or Flutter, there's really not a whole lot of value to be had simply because there's not a lot of known vulnerabilities. Supply chain security tools aren't going out there and discovering application security vulnerabilities in open source code. We're simply saying, hey, you're using this dependency. What are known vulnerabilities related to it? How can we help you prioritize which ones to remediate first, either through upgrading or replacing that dependency with a more secure alternative? So as of the last time I checked, there were about 16,000 total advisories on the GitHub Security Advisory Database. And these have all been reviewed and verified by the advisory maintainers. Roughly half are either a high or critical severity. And in my experience with reviewing thousands of advisories, anything less than a high severity can usually be ignored. 
especially if you have highs and criticals impacting your application. Definitely always prioritize the highs and criticals first. You maybe have heard of solutions like the Exploit Prediction Scoring System, EPSS, or CISA's known Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog, the KEV, which can also be used to prioritize vulns based on their likelihood of being exploited. However, if you take a closer look at these, especially the known Exploited Vulnerabilities Catalog, you'll find that they really focus in on commercial products and standalone applications. For instance, EPSS signs a very heavy weight if Microsoft is mentioned in the advisory. And Kev really only has a select few advisories related to any open source project at all. Moving along, let's take a look at how to manage these vulnerabilities. Here's an example of just seven projects which I've run SemGrip supply chain on, but without our reachability analysis filter enabled. This is intended to be a one-to-one -one matching of what you would see using something like Dependabot. But I'll be walking through what we do differently to make this number much more palatable. Now, 2,500 might seem like a little or a lot, and that's just gonna depend on the size of your projects, how many dependencies you use, et cetera. But to put it into perspective, I've seen orgs with a total vulnerability count in the high six figures. Hopefully you're already using some sort of supply chain security tooling and have a rough idea of your magic number. For those of you with a big number, it's no surprise that Sonotype has reported that supply chain attacks are increasing at a rate of 742% per year. Now, that being said, let's talk about prioritization. Well, the likelihood is that you're using some tool other than SemGrip supply chain, if any, so your security staff or developers are likely to approach the problem with questions such as these, especially the obvious ones. You know, are we even using this function and is it even exploitable? Then they'll likely spend valuable time and resources only to learn the code does not use the vulnerable function making it unexploitable. We don't care about this. Or my personal favorite, the vulnerability is a critical severity, but it's a regular expression denial of service vulnerability, and it's on an internal application. There's no risk. We can ignore this. Don't spend valuable security engineering time fixing these ridiculous vulnerabilities. That being said, open source dependencies enable impressive efficiencies. There's no doubt about that. But time spent by your staff to investigate these questions takes away from that value. So let's touch on how reachability offers near effortless prioritization. In the traditional sense, SemGrip supply chain still falls under the dependency scanner category. No different than a Dependabot or OWASP dependency check or NPM audit, just to name a few. So using a traditional solution like those mentioned, they more or less take a vulnerability database and see thousands of vulnerabilities. And then they report the hundreds which impact your dependencies based on their version and the name of the dependency. But by introducing code scanning reachability, you can narrow down from hundreds to just the tens that result in an actual vulnerable usage. Otherwise meaning the vulnerability actually rests in your code. Now I have a slide to get deeper into this, but at a high level, reachability to us at SemGrip means that the piece of a dependency that introduces risk, aka the vulnerable component, appears in your code, or is it reachable in your code. The magic sauce on how we do this is in our usage of the open source SemGrip engine, which also powers our other commercial products. This enables our researchers to write SemGrip rules that detect the vulnerable usage of dependencies. If you've ever used SemGrip, whether it be the paid version or open source, you probably know how easy it is to write SemGrip rules, and so we can do this very efficiently. Let's move on and discuss software composition analysis, often called SCA, which is ultimately the prioritization enabler. Afterward, we can look at some more research backing our claim here, which suggests reachability reduces thousands of alerts into tens of high quality findings. So here I've broken up SCA into four different categories, manifest, lock file, static analysis, and dynamic analysis. And each of these offer insights into a project's dependencies, just in different ways. Manifest files will tell you what direct dependencies are used, but really not much else. This isn't all that effective these days. Next, we have lock files, which take things a step further by also presenting specific versions tied to those dependencies, and also include any transitive dependencies. So any dependencies required by the dependencies being imported into your project. Now, manifest and lock file analysis are what I often refer to as traditional SCA whereas the industry has since incorporated other techniques like static and dynamic analysis. Now, I'm not going to argue static versus dynamic analysis. It's, we just don't have enough time for that. But you can probably guess that I prefer static analysis, especially in the context of software supply chain. 
The two main reasons are that A, build reproducibility is often a nightmare, and with static analysis, we don't necessarily care if your code can run, and B, I enjoy research at scale. Simple as that. I can confidently run SEMGRIP against thousands of projects without manually tuning each and every one of them to get dynamic analysis to work. Oh, and dynamic analysis is significantly slower, at least based on my experience. So that said, there are some potential benefits to dynamic analysis. The obvious one being that in static analysis, we can't determine whether a path is likely to or ever will be taken, which means dynamic reachability could be slightly more effective in that regard. But based on the research I've reviewed, the complexity tends to cause static analysis to be favorable with only marginal benefits to using dynamic analysis. And that's why at SEMGRIP, we use a combination of manifest, lock file, and static analysis. This gives us the best bang for the buck, enabling effective reachability, but without compromising performance and usability. Now, I briefly described reachability earlier, but we should narrow in on this just because, similar to SEA, the industry seems to be using it to mean all different types of things. For example, CDXGen, which is the open source Cyclone DX SBOM generation tool, calls a dependency reachable if it is used at all in your code. Other tools may call vulnerability reachable if it impacts a direct dependency, or maybe it's affecting a public-facing application. Now, SEMGRIP's reachability, which we commonly refer to as code scanning reachability, does as the name implies. It scans your code to identify where and often how you are using a known vulnerable function. If it finds a path where the function will get called, then it's reachable. And the way we determine these is based on what the vulnerability is from the security advisory. If it says, you're only introducing risk if you call this particular function in a particular way. Well, we can write a SEMGRIP rule to identify that usage in your code. And this has been proven time and time again to be effective, but to reference some external research, there's a paper by NC State titled A Comparative Study of Vulnerability Reporting by Software Composition Analysis Tools, which found only 2.1% of roughly 2,500 vulnerability alerts were found to be reachable. And that's through static code analysis. Early on, we at SEMGRIP conducted an internal study specifically using SEMGRIP's reachability analysis and evaluated 1,100 open source projects. Of these, SEMGRIP identified 932 total vulnerabilities, but only 12 were determined to be reachable. And that's actually less than 2%. But keep in mind, there are several factors that may play a role in your results, most commonly the language of the project. For example, JavaScript and Python dependencies tend to benefit a ton from reachability. And that's just due to its modularity. Whereas other languages like C Sharp are more likely to be used by standalone projects where static code analysis is less capable of determining function calls. Discovering vulnerabilities is great and all, but what is objectively more important is remediating them. I mean, Sonatype's 2023 report discovered that 96% of known vulnerable downloads had a fixed version already available. So that's a pretty good sign that open source project maintainers are doing a good job of releasing fixed versions. Log4j is a great one to highlight here because Sonatype actually has a dashboard for known vulnerable downloads, which last I checked had over 300 million vulnerable downloads since December 2021. And still, I mean, roughly 25% of downloads in the last seven days were vulnerable versions. So let's focus on what orgs can be doing better to alleviate some common struggles when it comes to remediating vulnerabilities, besides the obvious one, which is to use some form of supply chain security tool on. In the remaining slides, we'll touch on semantic versioning, manifest files, and transitive risks. All right, so semantic versioning is beautiful and I love it. I really can't express that enough. It can just be super beneficial for identifying easy wins during the remediation process. For example, maybe you have 200 vulnerabilities, but 100 of them have a fixed version that is just a patch upgrade. Now, if I was the responsible developer and saw this, I'd probably just hit the upgrade button. It's that simple. Although I maybe wouldn't suggest this on anything super important in production, just to be safe. Maybe an additional 50 are minor upgrades. Again, I'm just gonna hit the upgrade button. But if you're a more responsible person, I'd say pay closer attention to minor upgrades versus patch upgrades. Now, major upgrades on the other hand are the ones where I definitely want to take a look at the change log or other relevant documentation. And that's just because I've been bitten more than once by major upgrades breaking functionality or even worse, changing functionality just enough where it only slightly impacts your project and maybe you missed a test case. Lastly, just a reminder that most of what I've shared in this presentation is ecosystem dependent. So breaking changes may be more common in some languages than others.
Also, semantic versioning isn't actually enforced. For example, the study Breaking Bad, Semantic Versioning and Impact of Breaking Changes in Maven Central concluded that roughly 20% of non-major releases in the Maven Central ecosystem were breaking changes. But then again, that also implies that roughly 80% were not breaking changes. So if you're upgrading 100 dependencies, you're safe to, 80% of the time, you're safe to just go ahead and hit the update button. Now, let's talk about this in the context of a JavaScript developer, where you've likely seen a package.json file, otherwise known as your project's manifest. Now, if you're developing in a different ecosystem, you'll likely have a different file name, but the concept is more or less the same. A manifest file contains all direct dependencies used by your project and what is used to generate a project's lock file. We touched on this a bit earlier when discussing SCA, but as an example, whenever you run npm install or directly generate a lock file with the package lock only flag, npm is looking at your manifest file, your version ranges, and then assigning specific versions to these dependencies, while also determining all transitive dependencies as well as their respective versions. Now, what most people don't realize is the potential ROI when you keep a manifest file up to date, especially when paired with meaningful version ranges. For example, a dependency that is widely used throughout your project, you may want to actually review all changes before upgrading. But a package where you're only using only one component of it, or maybe you know it to be well-maintained and that it adheres to Semver specifications, you can safely assign a broader version range. So back to our example with NPM, you can get fairly creative on how you specify versioning for each direct dependency. To quickly go over some common ones, you can specify an exact version, use a tilde to allow any patch versions, use a caret to allow both minor and patch versions. So basically anything except a major version, or you can always go for the latest version via an asterisk. Just to show you a quick example of what this might look like in SemGrip app, you can clearly see your version and the fixed version. So if you see it's just a patch or a minor upgrade, well, it should be an easy one. Just go ahead and upgrade. A research paper titled A Large-Scale Analysis of Semantic Versioning in NPM reported that for the NPM ecosystem specifically, the minor flexible version specification was by far the most commonly used. And the study also determined that over 87% of all dependencies in their test sample were configured to receive updates automatically. But that doesn't mean they actually get updated automatically. A common occurrence is that new versions are available but you haven't updated your lock file in a while. Of course, this can be resolved by regularly running npm i or similar to regenerate your lock file and use the latest versions. All right, I'm going to be ending things on a bit of a controversial topic, which are transitive vulnerabilities. Now, transitive vulns are basically the dependency vulns impacting your project's dependencies. I often refer to them as third, fourth, or fifth party vulnerabilities, but the chain can go much, much further than just five. And in fact, it very commonly does. A little fun fact for you, the 2020 GitHub Octoverse report disclosed that the average amount of indirect or transitive dependencies for a JavaScript project with only 10 direct dependencies is 683 total. I always found that to be crazy and I still do. It's just imagining npm install 10 times and all of a sudden you're downloading 683 different software packages just for your project to work. Now, the biggest reason why this is somewhat controversial is because in reality, I mean, what are you going to do about it? If you use a dependency maybe affected by another dependency's vulnerability, there's really not much you can do unless you plan to dedicate engineering time to fixing the issue however far down the chain and applying this fix at each and every level, there's not really going to be any impact. That said, I do really enjoy the research behind transitive vulnerabilities. However, that said, reachability via static code analysis hasn't really impressed me. This goes back to what I mentioned earlier about active versus inactive code. For example, if I only import one function of an NPM package, transitive reachability via static code analysis won't know to only look at paths associated with that function. And this has a chain effect as you continue down the dependency tree. But at the end of the day, transitive risks are definitely real, and I'm hopeful future research and development will continue to make this more manageable. Anyways, at the end of the day, odds are that more than 90% of your vulnerabilities are caused by transitive dependencies. And I say just smack the easy button, ignore them. There's not much you can do about them anyway. If you see that there's any 
subset of direct dependencies introducing a mass amount of transitive vulnerabilities. Maybe it's an unmaintained project, maybe it's an older project, or maybe the maintainers just don't care a whole lot. Um, or maybe those vulnerabilities just aren't reachable in their code and they don't care to fix them because it doesn't introduce any actual risk. So to wrap things up, I'll leave you with three main takeaways. Firstly, the effectiveness of reachability. We routinely see up to a 98% false positive reduction thanks to code scanning reachability. Secondly, build reproducibility and semantic versioning solve so many headaches. It's only inevitable with the recent push for software supply chain security that we see these become more of a priority. And lastly, the spicy take, transitive vulnerabilities can usually be ignored. I say usually because there are some very, very special cases, but even then, if you're using respectable packages, they themselves will often create a security advisory due to their usage of a transitive vuln, which ultimately makes it a vulnerability impacting a direct dependency. So transitive vulnerabilities don't matter at all if you're making security advisories for the direct dependencies. Now, this could very easily start a debate as to why the current standards for reporting supply chain vulnerabilities is ineffective, uh, but we'll save that for another time. And that about wraps things up. Thank you for joining this talk. And if you are at all interested in learning more about reachability or the SEMGRIP supply chain product, I've included links in the slide. Lastly, if you want to keep up with the latest in software supply chain security news, feel free to check out my newsletter, Cram Hacks, and subscribe. Or if you'd like to contact me directly, I've included my LinkedIn as well.